All right. So the moment that we've all been Where's waiting for. Let's just no. We don't have any background music, but we'll we'll, we'll do the bell. All right. So every year. Uh, we invite our uh, president and CEO, Clint Fouts, and I know most of you know him because unlike a lot of CEOs from a lot of companies, uh, he is out and about and very available to our agent family. So I know a lot of you don't know him, but some of you might be newer to West USA. And so uh, so we welcome Clint Fouts, uh, president and CEO of West USA. Clint, uh, welcome for our annual State of the Brokerage Address. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, and um, Happy New Year's to everybody. Yeah, Happy New, New Year as well. I'm looking for a good 2024, as you said, for make it productive. So the first thing I kind of want to go through, we always go through, is just the numbers that West USA has done. This closed transactions um, in 2022, we did 16,873, and in 2023, we did 14,986 for a loss of 11.18%. Mostly I blame Todd for this because he's the one who pulls the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so he always does a good job of looking at um, how to counter that. And he pulled Armless up. So all of Armless, Maricopa County, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, Armless did 85,815. This last year they did 72,000. 451 for a loss of 15.57 percent that means we actually beat the average yeah. <laughs> by 4.39 percent i play i actually mike probably to, did that for us so yeah yeah, yeah absolutely I, I was working hard <laughs> this past year having real estate conversations <laughs> Making copies. yeah and i usually go over the higher numbers um but i failed to do that this time but we are staying about average. We're still the, above the 3,000 range in the brokerage. But I do see a lot of agents that are retiring this last year. Um, so we've been able to replace the ones that have been retired. And unfortunately, or fortunately, being 38 plus years with, you know, you have agents that have been with us for a very, very long time that are looking at opportunities to retire and when able to do that this last year. And it's it's interesting to see the opportunities they've had and how they're doing it and, and retiring to that model. I know we've had different webinars on how to retire in the marketplace, but um, it's kind of exciting to be here long enough to see people start their career, go through their career, and then retire in their career. Um, so good for them. The next thing I want to kind of cover is the what to watch out for in 2024. Um, and I'll just say the, the number one is kind of the NAR, where they're going to want that um, inventory and their interest rates as far as what they're doing. Um, with the NAR, there's not a lot you can kind of do like Todd and Mike and them kind of said. This, you can't control it. You can only kind of watch for it. Um, I think the biggest thing is, is look at when you're, if you're representing a buyer, um, just make sure they understand how you get paid. And that could bring up the um, buyer broker agreement, um, whether they're going to continue to keep offering co-brokes or not through everywhere. It's up to the, the client, the listing agent and the listing to decide if they want to do that or not. And just make sure you understand and your buyer understands how you get paid, because I don't think you want to work for free. Mm -hmm. And then most likely they don't want you to work for free either. So. Well, let's. I, I think it'd be good for us just to take a moment, whether uh, whether you, Clint or Todd, just, you know, we do probably have quite a few agents on here that are like, I've heard rumblings about this NAR lawsuit. I'm not, I, I don't know exactly what it is and and what's going on. Uh, maybe we can go through some of the basics and bring everybody up to speed. You want to tackle that one? <laughs> well, these are dangerous topics, and I'll tell you why. Because nothing has been finalized. Uh, the NAR is back in the appeal, has requested an appeal and was granted the appeal. Um, so this is going to go back to court. So although the outcome of the first trial was uh, against NAR, we, uh, NAR was not found victorious. And, and the, ultimately what they're saying is because of NAR's policies, uh, just the bylaws of the associations and, and the MLSs, um, the fact that, uh, that there may have been collusion um, and price fixing, and that's really what the two words are as it relates to Sherman Antitrust Act. So that's the only thing they've been able to find. Of course, there's many sides to this equation that we're not going to be able to appropriately answer sure. here today. 
But uh, that's the premise of what it is. And they're saying that the seller, um, you know, doesn't want to uh, that that the that the listing agents hadn't been diligent in explaining the commission process to the seller such that the seller understands the value behind offering a cooperative broker offset to the commission that the buyer broker would otherwise or the buyer would be otherwise paying to the buyer broker if you've been in business in arizona since 1994 or before you already know this is the way business was done back then um, it's only been different since 1994 so if you've had your license after 1994 you only know what's going on right now and i don't believe people have been real good about explaining specifically um you know that that sales process what is the benefit of the seller paying a cooperating broker compensation so those are the issues surrounding the nar issue what we've been to what nar recommended about three months ago was that brokers which we don't usually do uh, meaning we don't tell you to do anything specifically um, and we try to keep your paper flow as low as possible um, but they were recommending that buyers agents begin to complete a buyer broker exclusive employment agreement right before they wrote the purchase contract just so that you can become well oiled with understanding it having some times today to present it before it becomes a true presentation right now when you're presenting it kind of systems are all normal same as they've been for the last 15 20 years but if and when it does change you'll have you will look back and wish if you hadn't uh you will wish you had started implementing that document today now that document came out in 95 mike you and i know we worked together back then um you know we uh, we used that document with every single buyer we ever had because we represented buyers at new home construction companies and so the concept was if a builder yeah. if a consumer went to a open house or a or a you know the the um builders model homes without you then procuring cause or the builders comment that you know you're not they're not going to compensate your realtor if you go without them on the first visit these are these are you know basically this is how this document can just begin today to protect you and keep everybody honest and so the way i understand it the way that i've kind of simplified it you know is you know as of right now the policy of the national association of realtors is that a seller when we fill out the er form or we put a listing on the mls there is no option for us to put zero on um, as far as the co-brokers go we can go down to to one dollar and so the argument from the plaintiffs is now we are now requiring sellers to offer a co-broker my understanding is that option could likely or possible, possibly go away so that now sellers could actually put their home on the MLS, offer no co-broke, putting the onus on a lot of us as buyer's agents to be able to present value and explain the buyer broker agreement and I guess in essence talk the buyer into paying us in certain situations mm -hmm. our, our commission. Yeah. Is that simplified yeah. enough? Yeah. Yeah. That's the other side that's of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the other side of it is, you know, how's it going to affect what we're doing? Yeah. Um, and that's how it's going to affect how we're, what we're doing. But again, I think it's because really the sellers don't, we've never taught the sellers what the value proposition is as to why we do that. I mean, if a buyer, it, we all know buyers have difficulty putting together their <clears throat> two and a half and 3% down payments with conventional FHA. Um, imagine that your commission, whatever you decided to earn was going to be added on top of that. Um, you know, if they have a hard time doing that, now they're really going to have a hard yeah. time. They have twice as difficult a time saving the money. So, you know, the, the, and then there's a lot of moving parts, uh, Mike uh, and Clint will probably may talk about this, but there's a lot of moving parts as far as federal regulations affecting lending, VA buyers, um, you know, all these different types of things that, you know, haven't even been thought of at this particular point. Yeah, we'll definitely cover a lot more of those as they come out and they roll out and any changes start happening. The one thing I do know is the real estate agent will not be replaced. As long as I've ever known, there's always been a real estate agent. There's always agent. been something saying there's, that we're going bye-bye, right? <laughs> there's always yeah, something. Always. There's, from the time I've been here, it's what's gonna happen and worry. And those like Mike's three pack, you can't control it, don't worry about it. I'm pretty sure from all the changes we've ever had, you'll still have a job, you'll still be able to do it. It might change, but you guys will be able to handle it. I, I'm sure. So as far as the, the next thing kind of looking at is the, um, the interest rate drop is kind of that perfect. And I, I don't think they're going to drop it too fast, but I think there's a lot of buyers out there that are in the, or sellers, I should say, and buyers that have been sitting in the, 
back in waiting for something to happen. And then the media comes out and says, Hey, this is a great time. This is interest rates have dropped, go buy or, or do that. And my concern is, is the lack of inventory that's coming up that could be another switched pretty fast into a, <laughs> to a position where we don't have enough inventory. Um, so that's the next thing kind of look out for and kind of build your business around the fact of looking for some listings and putting those listings back on the market. Hopefully it's able to, you know, Todd would probably say it but better, but as far as we have enough inventory to control the demand and the demand doesn't go too high. So I don't want to see the interest rate just completely drop. I think it'd be bad for the market, um, but it does need to come down. <laughs> so I would like yeah, to see to bring it come the people down. back in the business. Yeah. Yeah. Over the next year. Yep. It'd be nice if it come down. Um, so that was kind of the next kind of the thing, just kind of watching the inventory slash and, and Todd's go over the number every single week, um, what that looks like. Um, so where so. do you want to see the interest rates at? Because I would like, I'm not done buying investment property. So I'm be honest <laughs> with you, I'm kind of comfortable where the rates are right now because yeah. yeah. I don't want to overpay. And I know that I can refinance later. So I'm, I, I just wish that I had that that red phone to the Fed. Like, just hold off. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, when I'm I'll let you know when I'm ready for rates to drop to five and a half percent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It was, I know back when I bought my first house, seven, eight percent was great. I didn't mean I remember my dad saying, hey, you need to buy us down to seven, eight percent. I didn't have any <laughs> problem with that. I mean, the price of the house is a lot less. But, you know, it was so it I mean, I, <sighs> At the end of the day, I don't think it it matters. Um, we just don't want to see the fluctuation up and down and, and back and forth and creating markets based on interest rates. And my dad used to always tell me, and I know this isn't for you, is your home isn't your investment. Um, it's where you live, and that's what you should keep it at. Too, way too many people finance their bank accounts off of their home mm -hmm. and, and, and keep refinancing and live on them. And that's just the way that I think it's the America way now, what it comes down to. And I don't think I've ever refinanced my property to to take out and yeah. put money back in my bank. And when I read you to refinance, it was more for the interest rate than it was for any kind of cash out type situation. And um, that's just the way I was raised. And it's now there is that also being said that real estate is a great investment for that. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if your personal property should be the one that you should invest in as far as great opportunity to own, but I'm not sure it's a great opportunity to reinvest and continue to keep refinancing it to the point and keep going oh, for that bottom dollar for yourself. hundred percent. hundred percent agree with that. I mean, yeah. it, it is, it's just for us, it's your first home. It's your first home as far as building a real estate portfolio, but mm -hmm. it is the place that you live in. Mm -hmm. And our, for us is when you go to sell and move, don't sell, just turn it into a rental property and go right. buy home number two. Okay. Yeah, anticipating nobody's staying stagnant, you know, incomes are increasing over time. And that's the thing, you know, Clint, you said it earlier, you know, you, you mentioned that, well, yeah, but, you know, int the sale prices were less back then. Well, it, the cycle that we really need to know is because, you know, control the things you can control, don't control the things you can't, um, is that inter the average interest rate in the United States since the beginning of recording of mortgage interest rates is to as of last month was 7.7%. That's the average, which, you know, was a lot higher until we came into this 2.5 market that hung around for a lot longer than it potentially should have. But the 18.9% market was here at one particular point. Um, you know, and, and <laughs> income is always shifts in income is always the last thing to recover in any market cycle that we have. So what are we seeing right now? Interest inflation had been really high and, and was faster and higher than what our incomes were rising, which was a horrible experience for all of us. Um, now, what 2024 should bring is more income and everything should be settling. So if that does occur, um, then again, don't stigmatize the market because you think two and a half or three and a half is the rate it should be at or five and a half. Be thankful and happy it's under seven right now. Mm -hmm. and, and realize that in 1991, the average inflation was, uh, excuse me, the average appreciation was about four to four and a half percent. The average interest rate was about six and a half, six, six and a half percent. And investors were flocking to Arizona 
to buy real estate. In fact, Mike, I think you were part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> but I'm no, part of many problems. Yes, no, no, just kidding. With the, with the understanding that when I first met Mike, that's what his whole t shtick was, um, was, was, you know, basically selling investment properties, which it still is. But to that point, so don't stigmatize your own market. You know, when you're out there and you're talking and people are negative, you know, try to find the, the workarounds, try to find the solutions or, or leak out a little bit of a solution and say, hey, you know, I know this is a party, but if you want to talk more, you know, call me this week, you know, or give me your card or let me know your number, or, you know, whatever. Um, but again, you, you, you have to have the solution. I guess that's really what it boils down to. If it's 10%, you have to have a solution. If it's two and a half percent, you still have to have a solution. So, you know, just think of that when you're moving through 2024 is that you can't change what you can't change, but you can have a solution to what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know, kind of like being in real estate for 38 years, you know, it's, real estate's never going to stop changing. There's always going to be changing. Those and you're only 39 years old, so not yeah, bad, bro. Happened. I know, I know. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's a buyer's market, there's a seller's market, there's a neutral market, and there's multiple of things that happen to create those um, markets in place that, that affects. But when you think about it, I know Todd and Mike have been in real estate long enough to realize that you, it kind of comes back around. You already have the business plan for the market you're in. It's just kind of like, I mean, I look at it and like, what market are we in? And I go back to you know, five, 10 years ago. And it's like, oh yeah, okay, that's that's what we used to do. And let me flip to page 32. 32. Yeah, and then, exactly. You know, that's the market you're in and and you kind of warp it to whatever's happening today. And, and it's kind of the same thing over and over again. Um, but the one thing is, is real estate is, it's, you're an independent contractor. You're your own boss and um continue to keep focus and continue to keep doing what you do there's you got to figure out at the end of the day you have to be very upfront with yourself and figure out what your why is and why you do what you do i see a lot of agents coming in the business and they're i just love to help buyers and sellers and then a few years later that changes and they're not so much about that as much but they're in a different situation they're wanting to help people but it's they start getting beat down and then, you know, 10, 15 years into it, they, they want something more, they want something different and just got to figure out what your, what your why is, why you do it every single day and make sure you put it on your, make sure it's in front of you all the time. Um, and make sure you know why. And then when you set your goals, um, it, it's great to like Todd says, make sure you do this many transactions this is my income. But at the end of the day, make sure you put small little things in there to make sure you are a win every single day. So if I put two more people in my CRM today, that's a win for me. Or five more people in my CRM, that's a win for me. Don't just think it's the same thing of talking. And, and, and we we talk about, like like Mike said, you know, we picked up a person, we always talk in real estate. But at the end of the day, what does that look like? If I talk real estate and I picked up no clients and I have nobody mm -hmm. in my CRM, mm -hmm. then you talk to real estate and then you know, maybe next day or the next day. But at the end of the day, if you get set back and your spouse says, hey, what'd you do today? I put five people in my CRM today that are gonna potentially be buyers and sellers in the future or I've talked mm -hmm. here or there. Make sure you reward yourself and, and verbally and mentally <laughs> um, That's a good about those wins. That's a really good point. Because if you don't keep those wins in, in place, you're just setting yourself up to to exhausted. really <laughs> right what's that to be exhausted and, to be, and to yeah get I mean, to that point where you're not happy you do it's 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 kind of interesting with my I, my father used to sell real estate for many many years and i remember people used to ask what he did and he said he was permanently unemployed looking for a job every single day and oh, that fact. mannerism awesome. just to me seems exhausting and when he when i was growing up he wanted he wanted to know if i want to be a real estate agent. i'm like i don't want to be a real estate agent I want a life. And to me, it just seems exhausting that every single day you're looking for a job and everything else, but it's the little whys. And it, and I found out later being a business owner, it didn't matter. Real estate's one of the best businesses you could be in as far as a, a startup and concept and what repercussion and being paid for what you're worth. Um, it's, it's the greatest opportunity out there. And, um, but my perspective of it was, was not that at the time until I learned, being a business owner, doesn't matter what business you're in, you're going to continue to keep doing it and um, and have put the, the long hours in and the, the work. Um, and just, you know, again, making sure you don't get burnt out is it will happen if you don't watch it and, and constantly look at those small little pieces that, that make a win. So how, how, how do we then, you know, and I have some ideas, 
you know, but you know, how do we avoid the burnout, especially the newer ages? Because you bring up a good point. It's it's always the here and now. Mm -hmm. There's this pressure mm -hmm. that I have got to put food on the table, and it's just an absolute grind. Mm -hmm. And no matter how passionate you are about it, when you start, that grind mm -hmm. will just grind you into the ground mm -hmm. and so forth. And I think a lot of what we don't do as agents is spend the time with other agents who've been doing it for five, 10, 15 years of like, okay, what, what are the lessons that you've learned? How did you think long-term? Cause we're not thinking long-term. How right. did you, how did you think long-term or looking back? What would you have done different? How'd you get to be where you're at? Because at West you would say one thing, um, you know, you know, I mean, we have agents that have been here for forever and agents that have some of the most successful and top agents, not only in the state, but in the country who have gone through all of it, have got a lot of lessons to share uh, and are willing to share. So one thing I've, I love about West USA's agents is they're very gracious with their time. They're very willing to share, but nobody's asking for their time and nobody's asking for their advice. It's true, but I think that when I watch most real estate agents and been in a family real estate agent, everything else, it's it's more by accident. They walk around, they talk, make conversations, everything else, and they're waiting for the next client, and they're not actually business plan. I'm not spending this much time, and quite honestly, I, I say that. But anytime I've ever talked to top producers, they have that time slots for buyer calls and seller calls and everything else. But when you talk to the, somebody that's struggling, it's like you talk about those things. They don't. They they're buying leads. They're waiting for the leads to come in and call. They're doing certain things. They don't set the structure up. I, early on, I had interviewed an, an agent um, that had been working for us, and this is way back, um, probably in the early 90s. And this agent was, in my opinion, a little cocky because he literally said, I don't work nights and weekends. I work from nine to five and five days a week. That's it. I'm like, well, how do you show properties? I tell them I don't work. They take time off work and they come out. And thinking, and you don't answer the phone on the weekends. You don't. <laughs> he's like, well, I answer the phone because I have buyers. You know, things that happen on the weekend, but I don't necessarily. I'm not available for an everyday product from that type of thing. And I realized something. He was very productive from eight to five every single day, and he let his clients know, and he his clients were appreciative of that. And he did a great business, and he actually charged a lot on commission because he was worth it. I think it was in the range of 10% at the time. And I was like, <laughs> and he just told us what I get paid. Here's what I do and explained exactly what he did. Um, and he, that's the way he ran a business. He was there for his kids, his wife. He wasn't going to beat himself down and be a slave to everything. And that takes me into the, the next thing, which maybe I shouldn't, but it's um, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> we go. I love it when we start off that way. He's going to end with four minutes with a bang. Hey, uh, so NAR <laughs> has done a study. Um, and we were notified that we were part of the study yep. and they sent us the information on it on Friday. And am I in trouble? You could be. Yeah. So I was reading over it because we haven't had a chance to have a meeting. We haven't had a chance to talk to an AR about it or anything else. So it's I, what surprised me is they had two buyers contact agents on a property they had listed or for property one way or another. And they were recording how that person was dealt with. And when I was reading multiple of these things, and I don't know exactly how many, I'll get more data on it. The amount of agents that did not respond, they usually had to call an agent two to three times to get a return response. And when they did get a return response, they didn't get the information they were looking for, or they never thought the agent were followed up with what they said they were going to send. And I don't think that's just West USA. I think that's a problem Industry. all across real estate agents because mm -hmm. unfortunately I think we get, our agents are available 24 seven. They have a lot of people that are contacting them on their phone that are trying to sell you stuff. And it's hard to, to take out and figure out who the real clients are as the people that are just trying to sell you something and to doing it. So, I don't know how, and I think that's one thing we're going to figure out is how you separate. I know we 
at West USA, we have our phone number. We do. We want to make sure that you get the messages. With over the years, I think most agents have started using their phone, their cell phone, carrying around with them. But that opens up a whole lot of problems, right? Well, I remember one time we had a um, a vendor come in and they recorded conversations, and it was horrifying listening to some of the agents and how they're answering the phone. Um, and you guys own a business. You can have a business phone number. In some cases, I'd rather see a business phone number go straight to a voicemail box and have a professional answer and then leave a message and then call them back than being a baseball game and having background noise or doing something that you really probably shouldn't have answered, but you're going to answer the phone because I'm dedicated to my client. I'm going to answer all the time. You, you have to set yourself some business times and standards and being able to treat everybody the, the same and have your, your business. All that, I mean, we're 24 seven and how can you provide that service 24 seven? It's really weird because this, on some agents, the first one they would take and it was perfectly great. The second one they called and they fumbled on it. And I'm thinking, why did they fumble on one but not the other one? Well, what they didn't show us is what time and day they called, where they called, when they called. So I don't think that the agents are picking and choosing who they serve and who they don't serve. It's just what's going on in their life, the time that client calls and what the client specifically asks at the time that we can call. And, but it's going to be interesting going through that list and seeing what is what they suggest and what's going forward. Because it's a third party. It wasn't an AR themselves. It was a third party. So, um, totally uh, definitely want to find out and if nothing else we'll hopefully be able to provide some training and be able to make all our agents better than everybody else yeah i wrote yeah. it down we need to do training on uh taking sign calls yeah every call yeah because you you know when what what every sign should have call between eight and five on monday or friday <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well you know and and i know it's it's our time and i just want to urge everybody uh you know to to maybe re-listen to the entire podcast today only because I think that there were some real true nuggets for 2024 that were shared with you today. Um, number one being, you know, and most importantly, what can you, can't you, you control? And then of course, uh, Clint's explanation of what's going on in the marketplace and how to, uh, overcome and achieve that. So Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's great. I, my head is spinning on this. Uh, like I'm thinking of a panel now, I mean, getting like, you know, I've already got some agents who I know are fantastic at taking calls and doing mm -hmm. some sort of panel. But nice. uh, anything else on your list? I don't want to cut you off. You pay the bills, yeah. so um, <laughs> no. So we don't have to end at any specific time. We can keep going. All I have left to say is work harder than the rest. Yeah. Um, and that's really what it comes down to, of what kind of 2024 you're going to have. All right. Appreciate it, Clint Fouts. Wow. Appreciate everybody awesome. joining us today. We leave everybody with the quote of the day. I'm going to start making Nick read these. Okay, Nick. Every year you make a resolution to change yourself. This year, make a resolution to be yourself. Ooh. And if you're looking <laughs> for resolutions and looking for things to change about yourself, I offer a special service. Just reach out to me and I'll let you know what I think you should work on. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Go out. Hello, home. <laughs>